Well, thank you, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to address this uh, interesting meeting. Uh, by way of disclosures, I've received research grants in the past from Danone as well as Abbott and the National, uh, Ca um, National um, Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, very briefly about milk proteins and proteins in general with regard to health in the elderly. Um, I've been asked to try to cut this down a little, and so I'm going to give uh, an overview first here to tell you that there's two f main uh, messages that I want to get across today. One related to the role of protein in the diet in general and, and in health status in elderly. And I'm going to zip through a variety of slides to make the general point that we have focused very extensively on lean body mass changes in, in the elderly and the loss of muscle mass and, in fact, the evolving definition of sarcopenia uh, or the, the extreme muscle loss that occurs in certain percentage of elderly that is associated with a variety of health outcomes that are all negative uh, is predicated on lean body mass. But what I want to really focus on more today is that the dietary protein and resulting amino acids has a variety of physiological functions and that we have to look well beyond the effect on lean body mass alone as the criterion on which to base uh, how much protein intake is recommended for the uh, healthy uh, lifestyle in elderly individuals. And then at the, uh, the second aspect of the talk, it's going to focus more on protein quality and recent uh, efforts to um, advance the quantification of protein quality uh, in a numerical way. Well, um, with regard to uh, lean body mass, the crucial question that we have to ask uh, with regard to protein intake and lean body mass is whether increased protein intake translates to more uh, lean body mass and improved health outcomes. And I can tell you that with regard to the elderly, this is a difficult issue. We know that um, the mechanism of action by which protein intake affects lean body mass or muscle accretion is by stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. And a very simple uh, 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 demonstration here from a study we did many years ago that the net gain or loss of muscle protein is determined by the balance between protein synthesis and protein breakdown. And in the absence of any dietary intake, we, in a circumstance where there's a net br breakdown of muscle protein due to the rate of breakdown exceeding the rate of synthesis. And when we ingest protein or amino acids, the si rate of synthesis is stimulated so that we enter into a positive balance. So this is the fundamental basis. But how this translates to the um, effect of dietary intake of protein on long-term lean body mass is less clear. Uh, there, and, and I will specify up front that we really don't have controlled prospective trials in which high levels of protein intake have been given over prolonged periods of time. So we have to look at shorter studies where there have at least been some dietary controls. And uh, if we look at, there, there have been several studies, and this is one uh, done by Dylan et al. in which uh, elderly individuals were given dietary supplements of essential amino acids twice per day. Uh, in addition to their diet, and this is, uh, we don't know really what the rest of the diet was, and this is one of the limitations of supplemental studies, but we have to live with that uh, limitation. And what this study showed was that there was, in fact, a gain in lean body mass in these individuals uh, when they had an increased intake of essential amino acids. The thing that I would uh, note here is that the change is, is fairly significant, but that but this is a change which plateaus, and it doesn't continue to keep uh, increasing. And in fact, other studies have not shown very significant changes in lean body mass over time with uh, supplemental uh, protein or amino acids. So um, how much effect this uh, uh, exer exerts in a long term is, is difficult to say in terms of lean body mass in elderly. Certainly, the more loss of muscle that has occurred in older people, the harder it is to improve lean body mass simply through diet alone. Uh, Population-based studies are difficult to interpret and, uh, often, but this is a result of the uh, 
uh, Heart ABC study in which a large number of subjects were followed over a three-year period and divided into quintiles of protein intake. In all of these subjects, there was a loss of muscle protein over the three years in uh, the elderly. Those that had the highest level of protein intake uh, had less, significantly less muscle loss than those that had lower. Uh, the highest intake here wasn't what we'd really consider high level of protein intake in the range of 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day, but it provides some supportive evidence that there may be some sparing of the lean mass loss with increased dietary protein intake. But really, I think that the, the major point in relation to this, as I said in the introduction, is that, that I think the focus on lean body mass is uh, probably not the main target when we look at health outcomes in elderly, that it's really very difficult to show significant changes in lean body mass even with uh, uh, resistance exercise in elderly, and that it seems that strength and physical function have much more of a direct relevance to health outcomes than uh, lean mass per se, and that in older individuals there can be a wide range of strength and physical function for the same lean body mass, and this seems to be more important in terms of health outcomes. And this shows just a, uh, uh, a, a large group of su su uh, subjects, about close to a thousand, in which mortality and strength was looked at in individuals under the age of 60 and over the age of 60, and again, uh, divided in terms of those that had the lower third of protein intake, the middle third, and the highest level of protein intake. And we look at the, uh, the all-cause mortality as well as cancer mortality, that clearly the, uh, that the individuals having the lower third of protein intake, a lower third of, excuse me, strength, not protein intake, strength, uh, the, those that had the lowest strength had the uh, worst outcomes. Now, all the epidemiological studies suffer from the same problem, and that is, of course, uh, we don't know that the loss of strength caused the mortality, but rather those that were sickest and uh, on their way to dying probably lost muscle strength. So these kind of epidemiological studies are not very conclusive with regard to health status and uh, the importance of strength, but I'm presenting it because it's pretty much all we have. Uh, we do know that in very tightly controlled situations that we can influence strength and physical function with uh, a dietary intake of amino acids and protein. The mechanism uh, that uh, uh, I think is important to understand with regard to muscle protein synthesis is that the process of protein synthesis and breakdown remodels the muscle so that as the protein synthetic rate is stimulated by a higher level of protein intake, even if the rate of breakdown is increased to the same extent so that there's no real change in lean body mass, we still get an improvement in body strength. And this is from the laboratory of Shreen Air in which the muscle strength is normalized for muscle mass and shown to be directly related to the rate of turnover of the muscle protein. So that, so that the important aspect of protein intake on muscle strength is stimulating the turnover of muscle protein so that the muscle fibers are, are uh, remodeled to function more effectively than uh, occurs at a lower rate of protein turnover. And what we see when we look at uh, trials where this uh, strategy has been uh, undertaken is that, uh, that we do see uh, increases in, in physical function in older people given either protein or amino acids as supplements. In this study, which uh, uh, was a 24-week study, we saw this is uh, from a group in uh, the Netherlands in which there was a significant increase with whey protein supplements given over a period of 24 weeks. Again, in free-living subjects, we don't really know what the rest of the intake is because it hasn't been controlled, but it's certainly supportive of the notion that stimulating protein turnover through increased protein intake can improve muscle strength. This study is one we did in our own laboratory in which everything was controlled completely because these individuals were 
uh, maintained completely in bed rest for 10 days so that every bit of food and every bit of activity was completely controlled. And you can see that this type of bed rest that is common in the hospital in elderly and why we in endeavored in this, uh, why we uh, endeavored to investigate this was because uh, of the hospitalization procedure in the United States of generally enforcing bed rest in elderly. And we see that uh, functional, fun these are different functional tests that are here on the side and that functional capacity was greatly reduced in these individuals when uh, given a placebo, when they were given extra essential amino acids, it almost completely eliminated the decline in the uh, functional capacity. So in this study, there, were, uh, uh, there was a complete control of all extraneous variables, and we see a direct effect of higher levels of essential amino acid intake on protein uh, on muscle function. Uh, I'm going to go through very briefly a variety of other areas that we have to consider when coming to the conclusion as to what level of protein intake uh, we should recommend for older individuals. I'm going to skip that slide because it's an epidemiological slide and show that there's been a, a representative slide of a lot of work. It was referred to in the previous slide that uh, uh, protein, in particular whey protein, has been shown to uh, reduce blood pressure. In this case, this study was done uh, by Ray Townsend in Philadelphia in which uh, just one single supplement had a significant effect on both systolic and diastolic pressure of, uh, of lowering uh, blood pressure in hypertensive patients. There's a, a, a complete literature in this area on the cardiovascular benefits of higher protein intake. We also know that, uh, that if we give supplemental essential amino acids that plasma triglycerides decrease in elderly. And at the same time, we see a decrease in liver fat. And this is work done in our laboratory in which uh, elderly individuals were given the uh, supplementation of essential amino acids for uh, a month. And we see a significant reduction of almost 50% in liver fat and, as in the previous slide, dietary triglycerides. So that so that we have uh, mechanisms related to risk factors, not only directly related to blood pressure, but also triglyceride and hepatic fat that can be modulated by increased intake of amino acids and protein. There's a, a considerable literature on bone health and protein intake. I think that uh, many years ago, it used to be thought that the acidification of the blood resulting from higher protein intake would cause a uh, a loss of mineral density in the bone, but a number of studies have shown this to not be the case, and in fact that higher levels of protein intake are beneficial for bone health. This is one representative study in which uh, subjects were given either a placebo or a 30 gram whey protein uh, supplement over two years, and what we can see is the, the uh, effect of, on bone of the uh, bone mineral density of those given the placebo over this two-year time period had a significant loss, and those that had the dietary protein uh, supplements, in fact, had this loss of bone mineral density prevented over this two-year time period. So that we don't really need to rely on epidemiological studies. We have controlled studies, uh, prospectively randomized control studies, that demonstrate a beneficial effect in older individuals of increased protein and amino acid um, uh, intake. And, and I'm highlighting here results. There are a number of studies that support each of these various areas of, uh, of benefits. We've heard already about uh, satiety today and uh, thermogenesis and some reference of the uh, partitioning of nutrients to muscle. So the point is that there's a wide variety of effects of higher protein intake that have physiological benefit in terms of health status in the elderly, and that we have to go well beyond lean body mass or what's really been used to determine protein requirements, and namely nitrogen balance, which is only a surrogate for uh, a lean body mass measurement, as, as not relying on that as the sole criterion on which we base our uh, dietary planning for older individuals. But 
The question of how much protein is optimal is really up in the air. We really don't know. We have different recommendations from the experts. We have the recommended dietary allowance, which is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day. And we also have the acceptable macronutrient distribution range of 10 to 35 percent of the calories uh, constituted as protein. Uh, these are both published in the same document uh, published by the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academy of Science. The um, acceptable mac the, the rationale be behind this is expressing it as percent is to understand the fact that protein is not eaten as an isolated compound, but rather as part of an overall diet, so that if we have a low protein intake, by necessity, then you have to have a high carbohydrate fat intake. Um, one of the things that's a little confusing here is that if we look at the RDA in relation to this uh, AMDR, that there is uh, a, 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 a sort of a dichotomy here, because if we take the uh, recommended caloric intake from the same document, and look at the uh, RDA as a percent of caloric intake, we come up with 9.1 percent and realize that in the same document, the minimal recommended percentage of protein intake in the diet was 10 percent. So that we can look at the RDA really as, uh, as a minimal value that we should be able to uh, uh, be sure that everyone uh, eats, but that in terms of the dietary recommendations, really, it's at the low end of what um, the experts have recommended as dietary intake. And this, this is from a, a paper from Victor Felgoni, which emphasizes that point where uh, it's a little complicated here, but I want to go through it because I think it's important to understand the uh, relation between recommendations and dietary intake. This is the lower level intake of the AMDR, 10% of the calorie intake. And this is the high end, so it's quite a wide range. What this represents is actual, uh, um, actual protein intake uh, taken from the NHANES data so that we can see in America most people are eating uh, closer to 15 percent, well above the RDA. And what these values represent is he took the dietary guidelines from the USDA and broke down the meal plans into how much uh, protein was in each of the meal plans, and that uh, came out closer to 1.5 grams a, uh, per kilogram per day, or in the range of 20 percent of calories, which is kind of in the midpoint of the AMDR. So that all of these things kind of come into the same area, which is well above the RDA. So that the perspective that we should be eating more protein than re recommended in terms of the RDA is really not a, uh, uh, a very uh, extreme position. It's supported by both what people are actually eating, what the USDA guidelines recommend, and in the mid, pretty much the midpoint of the uh, acceptable macronutrient distribution range. We clearly need prospective studies in which higher levels of protein intake are eaten over a prolonged period of time to really definitively address the question of how much protein should be eaten. but. Um, I think that we can conclude from all of these uh, different areas of physiology in which increased protein intake can have beneficial effects that we should be targeting a level of protein intake that's above the 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day. The second aspect I'd like to touch briefly on is a, a project that I've been involved with with a number of people uh, under the auspices of the FAO to revise the approach to quantifying protein quality. The um, PD-COS is a system which uh, currently has existed, and uh, this new scoring system has been meant to supplant uh, to try to come up with a way to quantify protein quality. And the uh, report came out, was published this year of the, uh, by the FAO of the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. And there are two aspects of the score of a quality of protein. One is the profile and abundance of the essential amino acids, and in particular, the relation of the profile of the essential amino acids in the protein to the requirements for the individual essential amino acids. And the second aspect is the true ileal digestibility of the individual amino acids in the test protein. So the way in which this varies from PD-COS is, in this case, 
not much, other than the PD cost is truncated at one, meaning that any protein that provides that if you eat 0.66 grams of protein per kilogram per day of that protein, of the test protein, that, that you can um, obtain a percentage of the essential amino acids that exceeds 100 percent, then the PD cost truncated that value at one, whereas the DIAS does not truncate the scores given the opportunity to, to classify dietary proteins over a wide range of quality according to a numerical score. So this shows um, the DIAS scores of common proteins, and I'm sorry that they're so small, but I can tell you just in grouping them, these are fundamentally the animal proteins other than soy protein is in here. Uh, one of these is right about here, I think, is soy. I can't read it from here, but soy protein is one of these. It's the only vegetable protein that's in here. The lower quality proteins that don't provide, uh, and so what this number means, again, to try to explain it more clearly, if we look at uh, some of the milk proteins here, if you eat 0.66 grams of protein per kilogram per day of the milk proteins that you will eat 140 percent of all the essential amino acids requirement. Well, what can we, how can we use these quality scores in a way to, uh, in a practical way to, uh, uh, to rank proteins? Well, the first aspect is, is there really, can we really um, extrapolate from these number, numbers to actual functional activity? And the answer is there's a lot of work to be done. There, there's some suggestion that this is the case. Let's just take a look at the comparison of whey protein versus soy protein. And this is a, a slide from Stu Phillips' lab in which the effect or response of muscle protein synthesis to 20 grams of intake of either soy protein or whey protein is compared. And in accord with their respective DIAS scores, we see a significant uh, stimulation of the protein synthesis with whey that is considerably greater than with soy. So that in terms of the relative DIAS values, we see a functional relationship in terms of protein synthesis. Uh, there are other, other types of uh, uh, studies like this that support the notion that this scoring of protein quality throughout the whole range of proteins is a viable approach, but clearly more work needs to be done to actually validate these uh, DIAS scores as a true reflection of protein quality on a relative basis. But if we take, uh, take uh, uh, for the moment the assumption that they do reflect a, uh, a, a, a difference in quality, we know at the very least that they reflect a difference in the ability to deliver essential amino acids in a given amount of protein. I'd like to, to show uh, the last two slides here to, to make the point in relation to the energy intake required to deliver the amount of essential amino acids required to meet all basal requirements. And if we express it just in the energy intake per gram of protein, we see that uh, there's certainly some variations in different types of proteins, but that fundamentally the uh, energy intake per gram of protein is not particularly uh, uh, extreme. If we now correct each of these proteins for the DIAS score, meaning the fractional contribution of each of these proteins to the total ability to provide essential amino acids, we get an energy intake per uh, gram of protein which is based on the ability to provide the essential amino acid requirements. And we see quite a differentiation in the proteins that, that peanut butter, while having a very high percentage of protein, relatively speaking, almost 25 percent, that the caloric density of the peanuts nonetheless means that you need to eat actually more than the total energy requirement for the day to meet your protein requirement, whereas some of the high quality proteins, and we look at, at whole milk or whey protein here, are much 
more effective in delivering the essential amino acid requirements for a given amount of caloric intake. And so uh, I think that uh, as, as time evolves and we get a better validation of these DIAS scores as really corresponding to functional capacity, this type of approach of trying to um, express or, or develop dietary plans in terms of the ability to deliver essential amino acids in the most uh, uh, calorie efficient manner will be quite an effective approach to, uh, uh, to the nutritional planning and recommendations. This just shows the difference between the two graphs where we've looked at here uh, just expressing the kilocals required per gram of protein and then in this case the kilocals required to meet minimal EAA requirements and then if we look at the requirement to meet EAA requirements, we have quite a different picture of the, of the, of the nutrient density of these different foodstuffs in terms of uh, protein quality. So to conclude, uh, in older individuals that uh, intake of protein greater than the RDA promotes better health outcomes by affecting many systems. And to just sort of answer a uh, uh, a, a challenge that's always issued is that many there are many studies that haven't shown much benefit and and I may have cherry-picked some of the ones that have shown benefit the important point I think with regard to deciding how much protein should be eaten here is to recognize that in no study that the RDA has been compared to a higher level of protein intake has the RDA ever shown to have better outcomes than a higher uh, intake the second point is that the high quality proteins, such as milk proteins, enable uh, the uh, targeted essential amino acid intakes as defined by amino acid requirements with less caloric intake than lower quality proteins. And therefore, we can't just consider a protein a protein, that we have to look at the quality of proteins. And in that regard, the milk proteins come out very much at the high end of the spectrum. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you for your attention.